Grand Rising, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Reverend Dr. Alice Reed. I've got to remember the extra syllable there. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm so glad to greet you here today um, on this Memorial Day weekend. And I want to remember just for a second what Memorial Day is about. Hot dogs, hamburgers, barbecue. No, no, no. I make light, but uh, honestly, it's an opportunity for us to really remember those who lost their life in service to our country. And so if we can just take a moment, and I want you to just go within and say thank you. Because we know that life can never be diminished or harmed or taken away from us, and that all those that gave service to our country and, and uh, out of their, their sense of duty and, and the love for this country, that even though they're not with us anymore, they are still there in spirit. And so we thank them for their service this weekend. And the uh, other thing that I know about Memorial Day weekend is that it is the official day that we can start wearing white again. <laughs> um, that's a silly tradition. You know, I had to kind of look it up. There's some place in my subconscious that it's sort of, it's in there, right? It's, it's, it's in my thoughts that, oh, it's Memorial Day. I can wear white again. Um, I looked it up, and many of you may already know this, but uh, the whole tradition of, or, or what I say, the, the trend of being able to wear white between Memorial Day and Labor Day had to do with the fact that there was a time when our, industri you know, our nation was becoming industrialized and the city was grimy and dirty. And so when you went to summer someplace in the country, you could bring out your white clothes and they wouldn't get all dirty and you could wear them all summer long and they'd be nice and, and light. Um, nowadays, you know, things are much different. We don't, you know, we don't have dirt streets and, uh, you know, a lot of factories in the city. And so you, and according to Emily Post, you can wear white every day of the year. <laughs> every day of the year. But I really was, um, I was kind of amused by my mind as I watched it go to that old belief, right? So it's like that's deep in my subconscious. And we talk about our beliefs. We talk about those things that, that we think and how they become part of our externalized reality. That's, that's, you know, that's one of the things that we teach people to do in our classes and, and in meditation and in spiritual practice is to really be here now and to recognize those beliefs or thought patterns that aren't serving us anymore and to help you and help me, because I'm still learning, to find, um, root out those things that aren't serving me and, and to replace them with ideas or thoughts that are um, more in alignment with my values. So this month, we have been um, following our annual themes, and this month we're talking about from good to great to grand. And in week one, uh, Reverend Karen did a wonderful job in talking about that inner landscape that I've just been kind of dancing around, that idea about what, what's in our thoughts, what are we thinking about, and how do, we, how do we mine that? How do we cultivate that and look at the things that we are um, thinking? And so she gave us some great advice about curiosity and observation and discovery. And then in week two, I talked about how our values create our reality and how, to and how to be intentional about that. And I carried that into week three, where we talked about some of the steps of, of living that value-led life and where we needed to look at where, what we were in alignment with, where our intentions were, and um, what it is that we wanted to make actionable in our lives. And so today... Today I'm talking about vision. This is all the things that we've talked about up until now are those things where we 
are using our mind to and our and and investigating our heart and as my dear friend Dr. Kathy Hearn would say, you know, investigating our bones if you will, to see the things that are rooted in our consciousness that are creating our reality. And many of those things are somewhat external at first, right? The things that push us, the things that move us forward and motivate us are often external. If you think about the, um, the fact that, get ready, we have 60,000 thoughts a day on average. 60,000. Now, some of you might have heard that, that statistic before. And if your thoughts create your reality, and you're having 60,000 of them a day, and that's like, I think it's 12 million a year, and it's up in the billions, if I multiply it times my age. <laughs> Those are a lot of thoughts that we think, and if thoughts create a reality, well, wow, that's sort of mind-blowing to think about that. But no reason to be concerned because it's only the repetitive thoughts that really create and lodge in your consciousness. Now, that might give some of you pause, <laughs> some of the things that you think about over and over again, but the, the idea is to pay attention, to begin to understand that there is this marvelous mind that we are always working with and that we do have some agency. Oftentimes, though, when we're working with our thoughts and our repetitive thoughts, we, they're, they're not always healthy, and sometimes they're just meaningless. Like, it's okay to wear white after Memorial Day. <laughs> That's pretty meaningless. It's pretty, it's pretty trite and, and unimportant, and yet it is something that, you know, it's taken up space in the divine database that lives between my ears that I'm working with. And so, um, you know, the, the, the ideas that I think we don't always give as much attention to while we're, we'll give a lot of attention to things like our career or our relationships or our finances or maybe the things that come up for you or the things in politics or, or what's going on in your local community. The, the thoughts that we really should be nurturing are beautiful thoughts like, I am worthy of joy, and uh, the world is a safe place to be, and I am loved just the way I am. Now, those are thoughts that are worthy of repetition, thoughts that I should be thinking about all the time, and you should too. And yet there's so much in our culture that is always clamoring for our attention. And it's like the low-hanging fruit, right? the low-hanging fruit of what's going on on the news or, you know, the challenges that are in front of us. It takes a little bit of effort to move our minds to those higher ideas, uh, higher ideas of, you know, the world is a safe place to be or, you know, I'm full of joy right now or, or that my life works exactly the way it's supposed to. Those ideas take a little bit of effort and intention for us to lean into. And I think that's why you're here today, because you want to continue to cultivate those, those healthy ideas, those ideas of, that support a life that you want to live, that support a community and a world that you, that you want to live in. And so I want to suggest to you that the, the problem-solving taste that we sometimes inhabit for all those things that try to clamor for our intention, that, that low-hanging fruit that can cause us upset and grab our attention, will sometimes, you know, I'm going to call them like pain thoughts because something's not working, there's something else I want, there's something that I want to reach for, and so there's this great saying that pain pushes and vision pulls. Pain pushes and vision pulls. And so as we look at from going from good to great to grand, 
it is our vision that's going to pull us forward. I mean, it it's, um, runs rampant in athletics, right? You know the athlete whose picture's going across the finish line and he's, or he or she is picturing you know, the success of what they have been training for. And so when we think about um, vision and the power of vision, I want us to consider that that is where we want to move our attention, attention to intentionally. That we want to be moving to that space of having repetitive thoughts about our vision, holding that vision in our consciousness so that that will pull us forward. I was um, thinking about this topic and, and about vision, and one of the things that I think vision encourages us to do when we're ready to let go of being pushed around. I'll call it that, right? Because sometimes this world can... You, anybody else feel pushed around with what's going on in the world, right? Sometimes, so instead of being pushed around by your discomfort or your challenges or your pain, to begin to tap that power of vision. To, so, because holding a bold idea, being willing to capture, if you will, a new idea, when we're a new thought movement, it would be very novel if we had new thoughts. <laughs> yes, yes, uh-huh. And if, if we're toiling around with the challenges of our life, we are out, what's the word I want to use? We out, um, crowd out the space to create or to, I'm going to put it this way, because while we are creative, when we're working with vision, we're working with the power that actually moves through us so that we capture a vision, we capture a bold idea. I mean, if you think about some of the bold ideas, I'm going to go back to some easy, this is a little bit of low-hanging fruit, but right, brothers, you know, it was a bold idea to think that they could fly, right? Everybody else was in the horse and buggy, and, and, and you know, these, I, I'm probably going to get my history mixed up. I'm not sure where the gas-powered automobile was in, in all of that. But, I mean, there, nobody was thinking that men and women, people could fly. Somebody had to stop long enough to capture a bold idea. A bold idea that... And, and the tricky thing about your bold ideas, the tricky thing about catching a vision is... Can you imagine the first person the Wright brothers told about flying? <laughs> what? You're nuts. Why are you wasting your time with that? Right? When you think of any of the amazing, I mean, if it, it makes my head spin when I think about the innovations of today, um, especially, you know, I'm in the health field, the medical field is just, they're just breaking um, old patterns and creating new innov innovative ways to support the human body and the body temple. I mean, if, if, but somebody has to be bold enough to catch a vision, to catch the power of a vision, and to let that vision pull them forward, to allow that big and bold idea, whatever it is, to, to land in so that we let it land in ourselves. There was a, um, uh, a beautiful book that came out about 10 years ago uh, by Charles I Eisenstein, and the title was The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know Is Possible. Now, that book came out in November of 2013, and I kind of did a little research and, and looked at some of the best-selling nonfiction books of the time in November of 2023, and most of them were about politics or about, you know, economic challenges. Some of the books that I noticed were, you know, about uh, 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 creating the, um, you know, changing the people that, that are in your life. I mean, everything was 
a lot of those books were sort of regurgitating, if I, if I can put it that way, the problems of the day and, a, and a new, another way to look at them or to move through them or to examine them or to, you know, to stay in what is, to stay in and continue to look at the way things are as opposed to having a new idea. It is not easy for us to slow down enough, to quiet our mind enough, to catch an idea. And there's, Judy, your um, meditation this morning is exactly on, on that same track. Judy did a beautiful meditation where she read about um, expansion and contraction. And when we are in an expansive place, when we allow ourselves to be in that place of catching a vision, that's when we're expansive, when we're open, when we are willing to get past maybe our best idea to some new idea that wants to come through. When we're, you know, working the problem, when we're in that place of problem fixing, that's often when we are just... Um, uh, the word, I'm a little distracted because I think the TV went off, so sorry about that. <laughs> it made a little noise. Um, that's when we are working the problem, doing that problem fixing, that's when we can often be in a place of contraction. I want you to think about the last time you had a problem that felt impossible. Bring it forward. How did it, can you remember how it felt? Do you remember thinking to yourself, there must be a way to figure this out. Maybe you're like me, I would go on the internet and start looking at a hundred different possibilities of how to fix something. That's a very contracted place to be. And we are working with the divine. The, I like to think of it as the divine database. Infinite possibility. And this philosophy is an a place where we can learn how to be possibility thinkers as opposed to problem solvers. And vision is the place where we can begin to do that. And we actually have this process called visioning. Now, it's not visualization. You're probably familiar with visualization. That's the thing that I talked about earlier with the athletes that picture the end in mind. It's a beautiful tool and it works really great, but you're still kind of working with your frontal lobe. Um, it's not creating a vision statement. We have this beautiful vision statement of a world that works for all, and that vision statement is so that we can hold that picture in front of us of what we want to see in the world. That's what a vision statement does for you. Visioning is a little different. It's distinct in that it allows you to simply create space within your mind and in your consciousness. And so the idea is to let go of your best ideas and your best thinking, to let go of the problem itself, and to drop into a place of accepting and receiving. And when we do that, we access what I'll say is a little bit of a different part of ourselves that part of ourselves where our humanity and divinity meet, that part of ourselves that gets divine inspiration. You know those ideas that sometimes come to you when you don't know where it came from? When sometimes you get an intuition to call somebody even though you're busy cooking dinner and not even thinking about that? Those are those places where the divine begins to use our intuition to speak to us. And, and this thing I'm talking about, visioning, is actually engineered in really cultivating and helping us to drop into that place of receiving so that it's rather than random, it's actually intentional. And we begin to allow ourselves to capture God's highest idea. Now, now is anybody here visioned before? Can you mind raising your hand? Right. So has anybody here never heard of this process called visioning? It's okay if you raise your hand. So, so visioning is a process where we simply ask for 
very open-ended questions. We, we get into a meditative space. Usually we try to generate a, a space of gratitude or love, a place of expansiveness when in our feeling, um, in our body temple and in the way we feel. And then we ask these simple questions. And they're, they're just, they're, they're not complicated. What is God's highest idea for me? or for my community, or for my job, or for my family, or for whatever it is that you've been toiling with in the problem-fixing department. We ask, what is God's highest idea of that? And we, and we try to drop into our heart as we ask that question. The, the next question is, what, what, what needs to get out of the way? What do I need to release? And we try to keep that open space of, by releasing. A lot of times for me, it's my to-do list, my best ideas, the I, things that have been tried before, my doubt that this isn't working, my monkey mind that says, I could be doing something else right now, right? You know what I'm talking about. Those thoughts that come through our mind. We want to really drop into a place of receptivity that... Third question is, what do I need to embrace? What is it that maybe I haven't been doing or that I've been resisting that I need to embrace and bring forward and, and, and allow? And my favorite question, that's the one where I get the most information for me. We're all different, right? But for me, the place where I get the most information is the last question. Is there anything else for me to know? It's wide open. It allows my imagination and my intuition to work together. And when, I do, when we do this process, then we usually anchor it in a place of gratitude and, and releasing the process. And, w and when we work with this thing called visioning, which is actually a really ancient practice that was made popular by Reverend Dr. Michael Beckwith, when we work with that, my experience has been as a practice user of visioning, my experience has been that the unexpected happens. Something that I wouldn't have thought of. Some person comes forward. Some newspaper article. Some I, I have created alignment. Remember when we talked about alignment last week? I have created greater alignment in myself so that I can be in that place where my intuition and my heart's desire and my imagination and my marvelous mind and my beautiful heart are all working together. It is a really beautiful process and we, we teach it here in classes, we practice it as part of our, our community. As a matter of fact, we're looking at creating some space to do some more visioning because we've got some change that we're looking at in our community and I really believe that we have some marvelous thinkers and creative people in our community, but I think the visioning is the thing that's going to bring it all home. Because one of the things that I know is if, it's, if, if what it is that, that's in front of me is easy, it's probably not mine to do. Mine to do is that place where I lean in and I allow God to work through me. Because if I really want to live in a world that works for everyone, if I really believe in that beautiful vision that, I mean, you know, I don't know about you, but when I look around, it's hard to believe that we could create a world that works for everyone. And I think it's because we're so focused on the externals and the things that feel out of our control that we haven't, many of us know this, that's why you're here, a lot of you have taken classes, you love this philosophy, but this is, this is our gift to the world, to be creators, not just from our own steam, but to be creators in tandem and in alignment with the thing that makes the grass grow, with that beautiful one infinite reality that, that already knows, that already knows the, the good that it is we want to create. I have a quote I want to share with you, but it's in that book on that chair. Judy, could you bring that up for me? <laughs> Thank you. We're about to um, teach the essential Ernest Holmes. And in the front of each chapter is a little piece of this 
book that Ernest Holmes wrote with his brother Fenwick that, um, I know the name of it, but standing here right now, I don't know the name of it. The Voice Celestial, thank you. Yes, this went right out of my mind. So he wrote this epic poem that is 200 plus pages long called The Voice Celestial, and it is very similar to the Bhagavad Gita, where it tells the journey of the awakened soul. And so I just want to share this one little piece in the second chapter, which is entitled, What We Are Looking For, We Are Looking At and With. It's one of my favorite quotes of Ernest Holmes because he reminds us that the very thing that we want, we already have because it already exists because everything exists in the one infinite reality. So the, the journeyer or the farrier says, the farrier says, the, br the brazen gates of doubt are risen to show the wonder of the whole would I could know the meaning of the part, I, who in pain have searched the wisdom of the world in vain. So the journeyer is just lost, right? He's asking, and so the presence answers him. O oh, foolish soul, O oh, child of ignorance, who knows so much in knowing does not know. I come to thee as I to Moses came, unstopped his eyes and showed the holy land, to know too much is to not know at all. The vessel full, too full to hold, the waters drawn from deeper wells cannot contain the droughts more newly drawn. For how can wisdom gain from knowledge if knowledge be of that which is untrue? A thousand falsehoods never make a fact. Turn then from thy half-truth, thy mortal mind, and go with me. Nay, not to distant stars, the way of truth is never out, but in. It's never out, but in. We, we think we have to gain knowledge. We think we have to know everything. And I am here, I am here as proof. There's a lot I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot I don't know how to do. <sighs> but I know where knowledge comes from. It, it does take a pit stop in universities and schools and books and people that I've met. But true knowledge comes from the one infinite reality. And then it moves through the universities and schools and the wise individuals and the books. It moves through you. Everything that's ever been thunk already exists, and it is waiting for you to capture it, to be bold, to have a new thought, to harness vision so that we can create a world that works for all. Thank you very much. Okay, one of the wonderful tools that we use to stay centered in that presence where intuition and humanity and divinity and imagination all live in, in synchronized harmony is this thing called spiritual mind treatment or affirmative prayer. So join me, if you will, as we celebrate the one space within that is accessible by all. It is everywhere. And it is nowhere. It is all-knowing. And it is our emptiness. It is the wisdom that we seek. And it is the imagination that we hold. And so I know for each one as we move from good to great to grand, that the secret ingredient is our willingness to be connected or to remember our connection with the divine. And so as we move through this week, I invite each one to simply be open-minded and open-hearted, to take whatever problem 
presents itself to you and to set it aside and to simply be in the quiet as it has been said be still and know that you are God connected to the one infinite reality that thing that makes the grass grow in ways that you can't even imagine and in ways that are so obvious that they're right in front of you and so I know for each one as we move through this week we remember that connection we continue to cultivate it we allow our minds to slow down so that we can be present with ourselves with each other and with this divine world that is yearning to experience each one exactly as you are and so I am grateful, grateful to know this deep, powerful truth that there is wisdom and it lives within each one of us, that there's no single font, there's no special exception, and that as we allow ourselves to accept and receive, so shall we have. I simply say thank you and thank you again. And together we say... And so it is.